TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch, we are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, if we happen to go live and we miss it, right above me, this is where the uh, highlights for the live will be. Don't forget, we do got the Discord where you can drop any suggestions. And we also got Patreon. This is where you can come so help support, you know, keep everything alive. Let's get into this, though, man. This is Lab Bible TV. I help the craze dispose of unalived bodies of or of A. Is this the dude that did the at the church where he did it in a church? Okay, we, we'll find out. 27 minutes, minutes with an East End gangster. Here we go. Can you just talk about what your early childhood was like and, and who your family were? Yeah, I, I mean, I was brought up by a, a great family. We were living in Fitzrovia. My mum was a Catholic. My dad was Greek, Greek Orthodox. But he left my mum to bring us up to what church she wanted to and um, so from there we moved up at the East End now the East End is a totally different culture to fit in where did I fit in I fitted in with all the kind of wrong people the bad boys and we formed little things and we go around nicking lead or something else like that my mother and father never knew nothing about that in fact, they didn't even know I never went to school. Because I was bunking off all the time. And I just went down the drain. I started mixing with the wrong kids, got into fights, got into arguments and different things. But the thing was, I learned to stand up for myself there because, you know, a young guy tried to take my brother Tony, uh, you know, uh, and give him a bashing. And I got stuck into him. And all the other kids, behaved themselves from then onwards and I saw that you know violence was a way of controlling situations and uh, it became that's what I try to teach my daughter not to do like you know what I'm saying like I'm not I'm not trying to be a parent right now but you know it's 24 7 when you whoop your kids that's exactly what it's showing them that violence is the way to control the situation so they're gonna go imitate that thinking that's how they get what they want See? Kind of all violence was a way of controlling situations. And uh, it became kind of a way of life. And it was one prison sentence after another, got done for blowing safes, got, got done for violence, got done for other, many other things. So it was in and out of prison. And I worked with a, a little firm from out of uh, West London and uh, they were in the safe line. So we get the gel and right and we go in post offices or wherever and blow the safes. Then, unfortunately, uh, I got involved with the craze. Twin brothers, Ronnie and Reggie. Y'all can read the rest. How I actually met the craze was, uh, I arranged to meet a guy called Cornelius Whitehead. And I went down there to meet him, and he didn't turn up. Ronnie Bender, the crazed driver, drove by. He said, Chris, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'd like to meet somebody at the Blind Beggar, and then turned up. And I'm catching a bus, because my car's in the garage. Come on, he said, I'll give you a lift. He said, the twins want to meet you. I said, look, I don't want to meet them, thanks. You know, I'm OK. If you need a few quid, I'll help you out. But I don't particularly want to meet them. He said, Chris, he said, Tony's down there, my brother. But I had to go. So when I go down there, they were perfect gentlemen, spoke to me, said, Chris, we're opening the club in Leicester when my brother's Charlie's opening it. Will you help us out? Can you bring anybody over there from Birmingham? I was doing right well in Birmingham because the car industry had just taken off there. Gambling had just been allowed. So there were casinos, betting shops, all that kind of thing. So I said... So they wanted you in for your connections? Yeah, I said if I can help. So I started taking people over there to gamble, and they did very well, and it all fed back to the craze. They knew people who were clever, 
They knew people who were devious. They knew everything. They knew if there was a robbery there, they knew who'd done it. it no matter where we went, but the people who were doing the moving were people like Charlie and a couple of the other lads. They were the ones who, 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 who moved out, out of London. The twins were stuck in the East End. They weren't interested in the bright lights. They wanted the bright lights to come to them. But they were pleased I was taking people over there who had money and could do stuff. And yeah, that's the problem, man. A lot of gangsters be wanting they, the bright lights to be coming to them. They want to put on for their city, which I understand completely. But I'm not going to lie, your city will take you out. You can put on for your city <laughs> from a distance. You know what I'm saying? And everything worked out fine. Then I'd have a drink with them. I'd go down and see them. And they were always, always really polite. And I remember they said to me, Chris, we've got a problem. One of the lads, who was very, very, very well known, God rest his soul, a good bloke, uh, is in jail and his missus is having it with somebody on Romford Market. Mm. Um, yeah, what's the problem? What, hey, is... what do you expect? You in jail. What you want your missus to do? Got to be sorted. He wants him up. One second, one second, one second. I gotta do something real quick. I mean, I understand, you know what I'm saying? Like, your ego get the best of you. You sitting up in jail, you think somebody can't, that you, somebody has the nerves to mess with your girl while you locked up. But you gotta think about it. Somebody don't have the nerves. Your girl got the nerves <laughs> to mess with somebody instead of holding you down. But he doesn't want him dead. So I've got to be sorted. He wants him hurt, but he doesn't want him dead. So I thought, okay, it's going to be done. And I went to walk away, and Ronnie Cray said to me, Chris, he said, I've got something for you. And he gave me a watch. And it was a solid gold Waltham, which they'd bought out of uh, watches of Piccadilly. Can I just ask what the, the difference between the personalities of Ronnie and Reggie was? Reggie was somebody who was quite deep, emotionally deep. His fault was he was a drinker, was on gin all the time, and taking speed. Mm. He, he came to me one day and he said... Off the liquor and speed, and you emotional already? Oh yeah, you're a really bad combination. Chrissy said, look, that girl he said you were with, or used to be with, he said... Um, I like her, he said, could I talk to her? He didn't, he didn't just go and talk to her. He came and asked me, was it all right? And I said, yeah, I said, she's free, you're free. I'm no longer with her. She's a nice person. You know, get together if that's what you want. Ronnie was a different kettle of fish altogether. Ronnie was somebody, I mean, in the films, you've got this party animal. You know, I'll come here for a shootout. Nothing like that. He was like more diplomatic than that, but all the time the diplomat, the diplomacy was another thing. He was looking out of his lenses under, underneath their feet, thinking, "Yeah, paranoid. You know, what are you at? I want to find out. And the only way I'm going to find out is not by shouting at you, not by bullying you, not being a nice person. It's always nice to be nice. It don't cost nothing. It can be quite sound, low key manipulative, but rewarding." And that was Ronnie Cray's attitude. But deep down was this tormented, demonised man. When he didn't take his medication, he was off the spectrum. He was off the roof. And you never knew what was going to happen. And invariably, we were Ronnie and Reggie having a fight. And Charlie Cray trying to separate them. Because if any of the firm or anybody else got involved, they'd start on them, the pair of them. So you couldn't, you couldn't win. My, my relationship was always good with them, to be honest with you. I presented no threat to them. I presented somebody who could help them. And I remember Ronnie saying to me one day, he said, Chris, he said, if anybody ever touched Reggie, he said, I'd put a dynamite jacket on, I'd have the detonators ready, he said, 
I'd light them and I'd walk amongst that, walk right amongst them, and I'd blow the lot up. And he meant it. He meant it. He would be prepared to die for his brother, and it was reversed. As he should. It's the same thing. Went to a club called the Dolls Club in Birmingham, uh, and a guy called Ray Mills, a very good friend, decent lad, said to me, Chris, he said, We're going down, I'm going down to London tomorrow. Why do you come down? Um, he said, I've never met your brother Tony, and you've never met my brother Alan. Yeah, just come down and say hello. And uh, met him, and we drove down to London. Then we came over to the East End. And we went to a pub on the Bethnal Green Road and their mother was in there, old Charlie and the family and the firm. And we had a nice drink and everybody was polite and everything went well. And Tony said, let's go to the Regency Club. He said, the Br Mills brothers have never been there. I said, I don't want to go to the, 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 the Regency. It's Saturday night gangsters there. Sadly, I relented and I went. And uh, when we got... So they never went, you tweaked. Oh, there. There's a... Rumour goes around, there's a party, and Jack McVitie comes up to me. Who, who, who I like Jack. Jack the Hat was a local criminal. And people liked him. I mean, he was a fun kind of character. When he lost it, he could be quite nasty. But all I ever saw of Jack, Jack was a fun guy. And he come up and he said, there's a party going. He said, are you coming? I said, well, what party? He said, round at Blonde, Blonde Carol's. My car, outside the Regency Club, this must be about sort of, half past 12 at night, is locked in by other cars. There were a lot of people there. Half past 12 at night, is locked in by other cars. There were a lot of people there. And Jack said, we'll go in my car. And we went to every Road. If you got a car, I'm telling you, if you ever in a situation where you can't get to your car and somebody say, oh, we'll take my car, don't go. Don't do it. Don't ever do it. I'm, for some reason, that's when all the bad stuff happened. I don't know if that's the case in, in this, but for some reason, that's when all the bad stuff happened. And no, don't do it. How about that? <laughs> we get out of the car. I go in, Tony goes in, the Mills brothers, and Jack comes in. Jack runs into the room shouting out, where's the birds, where's the party? Where's the music? And well, it was all playing, there were people there dancing and what have you and uh, a scuffle started an argument I oh, said so I didn't come down here for this you I, the crazy thing is you didn't but how you, you had no way to leave came out for for a drink anyway Ronnie Cray came out he said what's the matter I said Chris said you didn't come down here for this and Ronnie Chris said drop him off home because I had quite a, a lot to drink by then you know and I didn't like it, I didn't like what was happening. Anyway, I saw a gun come out, but the gun didn't work, so it was a frightening as far as I could see. Anyway, a man called Connie White had took me home. I'm sitting at home, and I'm thinking, well, Tony's there and my car's up there. You know, I'm sobering up now, I've had a coffee and what have you with my dad. And I called a cab, well, up one down and got in a cab and went up to the Regency Club and got my car and then drove around to the, uh, to, the to Everin Road. But I'd also got a gun, just in case anything had happened to Tony. And uh, I went and knocked on the door and Ronnie Bender came at the door. You should have never doubled back. You were home, you were good. I said, Tony down there, Ronnie. He said, no, Chris, he said, he's, uh, he's gone. And I said, all right, Ron, see you later. I went to walk away, he said, don't leave me. Now, we're talking about a regular soldier, a good guy. You know, a guy didn't frighten easy or anything. And I said, Ronnie, what do you mean? Don't leave you. He said, they've killed him. I said, what? Killed who? He said, killed Jack the Hat. Teachers of Tomorrow. I remember this in the movie. I remember this in the movie. I said, no, no, no. Not in a million years, not in front of a load of people like that. That's impossible. I said, where are they? He said, they've run away. 
I said, I left you. And what's your instructions? That they want me to take the body, carry it up to the railway bridge and chuck it over the bridge so that it can get mashed up by a train. I said, you mean to tell me that you have got to carry a dead body, the blood's still coming out of it? I said, and, and you are actually going to throw it over a railway bridge. To get to the railway bridge, you've got to walk 100 yards. You can't do it. He said, please, Chris, help me. So I thought, everybody's deserted. You've got, got nobody. You know, you, you, you're a decent man. If, if, if I, you ask me, for, if I ask you for help, you'd help me. I know that. So I went in and we walked downstairs and I walked in the front room and there's a body laying there. Which Craigsman had, had killed him. Reggie. It was Reggie. Reggie. Yeah. And Reggie wasn't, on the surface, a violent man. Always polite, always thoughtful, always a good character. Treated people nicely. What he did in quiet was a totally different thing. So I said, with Ronnie Bend, I went downstairs. And I realised Jack had been murdered. I walked into the kitchen and there was a basket of washing up, uh, washing stuff, clothing. And I looked through it and I found some socks. I give Ronnie Bender a pair and I took a pair and we put them on our hands. We, could, we didn't have gloves. Nobody was expecting to go into that kind of situation. And we went round and we tidied everything up. I went upstairs to the bedroom. So I got an idea down off the bed. I took it downstairs and Ronnie Bender and I managed to get Jack on, into the, on the outrider down and we wrapped him up. And we tidied everything up around. Obviously the blood stains on the carpet. We, we managed to get a knife and cut the carpet up and what have you. And uh, we, we, we did the best we could. In the meantime, a knock came at the door and my brother Tony came looking for me and he found, saw my car outside, and he was involved. And then again, another knock on the door. It's Blonde Carol. She's come back to her flat with her boyfriend, George, and I'm carrying up a bucket full of blood in the, you know, with a cloth where we've been cleaning up to put down the toilet, which was on the next floor. And Carol came in and she said, what's happening, Chris? Where's the party? I said, no, it's over. I said, but there's been one or two problems. I want you to go in your bedroom and don't come out until I tell you. Went downstairs with Ronnie Bender and Tony. We managed to get the body in the eider down, up the stairs and into the hallway. It certainly wasn't going in my car, but we actually wanted to get him into Jack's own car. People say they put a dead body in the boot of a car. It's impossible. So we, we got Jack in the, in, in the back seat of the car, laid him out there, and then there's an argument. Ronnie Bender said, I'm not driving that car. And he was adamant he was not going to drive it. I couldn't drive it because I'm driving my own car. And Tony said, I'll do it. Believe me, that took some guts to turn around and say... Didn't Tony get pulled over to? Or like the police got behind him, but they didn't pull him over. Hey, you're going to drive a dead body. Went outside. We followed Tony. We followed him down to Mare Street, and then a police car pulled out in front of Tony. I think, please don't stop. Please don't stop. I don't want to do it. But if you stop my brother, and there's a body in the car, he's going to be accused of a murder. He didn't commit and everything else like that and I'm going to have to shoot you to get him away. And that's, a, that's the madness of it all. You, is there any sanity in it? There is no sanity throughout the whole situation. Anyway, we, the police car turned off, thank God, and on we went down the journey down the Mare Street and kept on until we got to the Blackwood Tunnel. We lost Tony and we were driving around the streets looking for him and eventually we saw him and he was outside of and around streets. The Black Wall Tunnel, a tunnel under the river 
famous connected East London to South London. Looking for him, and eventually we saw him, and he was outside a church. The car had run out of petrol outside a church, and there'd been a wedding there that day because there were all kind of petals and all the rest of it, and I thought, well, somebody will find it. That's the end of it, as far as I'm concerned. You know, we've got it off our manor. It's kind of away from everybody. Somebody will come to church or whatever they'll come out, have a look in the car, see a body, call the police. So, there's been an argument in South London. It's definitely not East London. I looked in the paper the next day, nothing at all. Radio, nothing at all. So what the hell's gone on here? I don't know that the Crays have got in touch with their brother Charlie and got in touch with uh, Freddie Foreman and, uh, and dragged them into it. So we are really talking about sensible people here, very clever criminals, masterminds, the, 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 the hierarchy of criminal intelligence and all this has gone on total total chaos total Very total san insanity Very sloppy, uncharacteristic. total madness and I thought everybody will keep quiet there'll be no no problems nobody's going to say anything uh, and the next thing was they all got arrested, more or less all at once, all the firm, but Ronnie Bender, Tony, myself, no. So everything was kind of safe. And then what happened was that uh, and I was arrested at Arts Hotel. No, I wasn't. I was arrested outside the, uh, the a nightclub there. And um, car, I was driving down towards it, the elbow room, and they surrounded me pull shooters out, put your hands on top of the car, which I did. They take me to Tintagel House. All of this, let me tell you something, all of this, I wouldn't even say all of this because he didn't want to go to a party. All of this because he left his car when he went to a party and had to go back and get it. I'm telling you, don't ever leave your car somewhere that you don't want it to be left. Don't ever not go in your car when somebody say, oh, I'll drive, just take your own car. On the embankment, and I thought we would, we would probably go to Scotland Yard. It wasn't that at all. And um, they kind of went into, I went into a room, they took me into this room, and there's photographs of the craze, and all their coverts are all there. And um, he said, do you want to tell us about it? I said, tell you about what? They said, the McVitie murder. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. They said, you were there, but you left. I said, no, I don't know. I honestly do not know what you're talking about. Murder? No. And they said, look, we do know, and we know you had nothing to do with it. Tell us about it. And neither you nor none of your family will be arrested. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. But they tried to get you the cleanest script. They was taking everybody down, they didn't care, they was going to script you. They were loyal to me and I was loyal to them. Some of them got nicked, they never put me away. And I certainly wasn't going to put anybody else away. Whether it was the craze or anybody else, you don't say anything. You don't stand in the dock and point your finger at people. That's the rule of law in the East End. It always has been, it, it probably always will be, amongst the growing generations. Anyway... He let me go, Nipper Reed, and he said, look, there's my card, ring me. I'm here to help you. Instead of walking away, just forgetting it all, I went and saw Mrs. Cray. I went to Bunny Hill Row, knocked on the door, Violet invited me in, and there was a guy, a guy called Caroline there with him, with the, with the family. And I said, look, the police have arrested me. Well, they, they, they brought me down to London. I've been to a place called Tintagel House. Believe me, there's a lot going on. They've got boards full of connections and everything else with the twins up there and it's not looking good. And she said, Chris, do us a favour. Their friends have deserted them. Please, please, will you not just come and tell them what you told me? I said, I can't do it, Violet. It's too dodgy. She went, please, Chris, you're the only one who can help them. 
but she's violent speaking off emotions. You should have never went, Chris. You make two bad mistakes, man. Will you just come and tell him? I went to Brixton, went in, give a moody name, and Charlie Cray sees me and he goes, shouldn't be here, Chris, shouldn't be here. I said, I can't help it. I said, your mum wanted me to come over, just say hello to the twins. You shouldn't be here. And I went over, I spoke to them. Oh, they're overjoyed. And I told them what had happened. They said, Chris, don't worry about anything. It's all sorted. You know, just make sure people are not talking. One of them was in there seven times, wasn't it? Talking. But then went back to my normal life thinking everything's going to be smooth. It's okay. These are criminal masterminds. You know, they've got connections everywhere. Police, you name it. MPs, all the rest of it. Nothing's going to happen. But uh, it did happen. Nipper Reed came and got me in Birmingham again. Brought me down to London. Why did you go to uh, Brixton Prison with Violet Cray and Charlie Cray? You were there. I said, yeah, I went to say hello. You don't say hello. I told you I was trying to help you. I told you, you, you had nothing to do with this. And that's what we've got. Now tell us about it, what happened? I said, I don't know. Don't know what you're talking about. You're talking a load of rubbish. No, I'm not talking, and it, I, I infuriated him that much that he, he was playing around with a gun on, on his desk and he ran around the table and he smashed me over the head with a gun. You don't want to tell me what happened, he said. Charge him with murder. Dang! Oh, because you wouldn't snitch, they put it on you? Well, that's not, that ain't, you know what I'm saying? That ain't no surprise. They police brutality back then probably wasn't even a thing. And that was Frank Cater, the... the other superintendent and I thought murder and Kata went murder he said yeah if he wants to be with the crazed he wants to keep shut on it let him be with them let him do the time with them and they charged me with murder they then took me to Bow Street Police Station Hyundai Santa Fe versus Honda Passport I ain't gonna lie that's an ugly situation for you my boy And I'm in Bow Street and I can hear voices. And then I recognise one as Ronnie Bender and the other one as my brother Tony. They had been arrested as well. And we go and stand in the dock. Well, you was off scot-free. Out of there. You hadn't had nothing to do with nothing. And you still, you the one got charged for murder. You was out free. I'm talking Free to frolic, free to dee 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 doo -doo, but nope. And I look in the dock, there's myself, there's Tony, Ronnie Bender, Reggie Ronnie, Freddie Foreman, Charlie Cray. These were the guys. We sit in that dock, and one after another, you saw the Cray firm getting up and giving evidence. Not against me, not against Tony, not against Ronnie Bender but against the Cray twins. It started off with the Crays going up and they got 30 each, which they kind of expected. And then Ronnie Bender went up and he got life and 20. Me and Tony went up and we got life and 15. Freddie Foreman and... and, and you got life and 15 for leaving your car somewhere that you didn't want to instead of following your heart like, damn, let me just get on my... Charlie Cray went up, they got their tens. Uh, Connie White it went up and got seven. Ian, the, the, uh, Ian Barry got 25. What did the Crays do? They throw all their friends to the walls. Did they stand up and say, no, them people shouldn't be doing time? We're the ones who should be doing time. They didn't commit any murder. No, they didn't. No, everybody goes down the drain. And so that was it. It was... It was a travesty of justice. Ronnie Cray was moved to Broadmoor High Security Psychiatric Hospital in 1979. He died in 1995 after suffering a heart attack at age 61. We know that already. Reggie was allowed out of prison and handcuffs to attend a funeral. Reggie died from cancer in 2000. It's all, it's all fantasy, a lot of the stuff. I'm sorry to say. 
you know, the Cray Empire. Well, I mean, they were all skimp when they died. The Englishes weren't paid the full money, so I believe, for the funerals. Well, have a look at Ronnie Cray's funeral, all the cars and everything else like that. Where did they get the money to pay for that? They didn't have it. Someone told me the other day that they had a four million pound mansion. No, they didn't. It was somebody else's. Their mum and dad lived in a council flat in Bunhill Row. I'd reached a stage where I couldn't cope anymore. I wanted to kill myself or kill a screw because that way I could justify being in prison. I hadn't killed anybody. Why am I doing a life sentence and all the rest of it? And I thought, don't think like this. You've got to get your head on straight. You've got to find something to get you through this. And under my bed, there were some books that a guy called Stuart Brown had left, a good pal of mine. And I went through them and there was philosophy, there was crime, there was this, that and the other, you know, all kinds of books. And there was a Bible. So I opened the Bible and that was the front door. And he came into my life and I've been blessed. Won't. I've got lovely children that have Won't God do it? Got university degrees. I'm blessed that I've got many, many good friends who've helped me, who've been there for me. Because you've got to understand that our man suffers in jail. I mean, the jail can be very nasty, but a man in prison deals with reality a day at a time. He begins to understand what love is. He understands what loneliness is. He understands what pain is, disappointment. But if your mind is focused on drugs, or it's focused on money, you don't see nothing else. You're blind. And there is n none so blind as them that cannot see. And there was nobody more blinder than me when I met the craze. I should have walked away. Because I knew it wasn't a good thing and it weren't going to end well. So advice he just gave was deep, you know, because some people be in a prison within their own mind, basically. You know, so you ain't got to be in a physical prison, but you could be in a, pr a prisoner in your own thoughts. That was deep. TLL, leave a like, comment. I'm gone. Subscribe, too.